our Christian life. And, uh, things will go right. Yeah. That's our perspective. Uh, if you'll find your place tonight, in uh, we're going to be in the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers tonight. Uh, it's the fourth book in your Bible. And we're going to start off in chapter number one. And we will be... Uh, in, in several chapters. Uh, chapter 1 is not the main chapter we're going to be in, but I, I, right now I have began a series. Uh, I'm call, it's a survey of the, of the Bible. In other words, I'm just kind of, I'm touching each book of the Bible, uh, Lord willing. I mean, there's, so there's probably going to be at least 66 uh, sermons in this series, but there's probably going to be more. Even though I lumped Exodus and Leviticus together, uh, last Sunday night, there's probably going to be more than 66 sermons in this series. I'm going to slow down uh, through some of the prophets and things like that. So, uh, the book of Numbers tonight, uh, and and in chapter number one, the, the title of the message tonight is, Lord, thanks, but no thanks. Lord, thanks, but no thanks. Uh, if you'll... Uh, uh, go ahead and... What, I tell you what, go ahead and stand for the reading of the Word here. In Numbers chapter number one, I let you I let you remain seated through the whole singing. So we've got to stand. We've got to uh, wake up a little bit now and get into the Word because Numbers. I don't mean any offense to the Lord, okay? But it'll put you to sleep. Okay, this chapter one will. It's nothing but numbers. It's a it's a, it's how many people are in the tribes. All right, so. Uh, it's not exactly the most exciting reading, so we've got, we've got to stand up. we got to stand up. Okay, so Numbers chapter number 1 and verse number 22. We're not going to read this whole thing, but I'm going to give you a taste of what chapter 1 is about. In verse number 22, it says, Of the children of Simeon, now that's that was a person in the book of Genesis, that's one of the uh, sons of Jacob, but this is talking about the tribe of Simeon. Okay? Uh, the children of Simeon, by their generations, after their families, by the house of their fathers, those that were numbered of them, according to the number of the names, by their poles, every male. Did you see that? Every male. It is not including the, the females here. Not, that's important to remember. Okay, and I'll Just make a mental note there. Every male from 20 years old. It's not even including every male. It, everyone below 20 years old, it's not including. Okay? Uh, and upward, all that were able to go forth to war. So this may not even be including guys that were so old they couldn't go to war. Okay, so this is war age, war ready men of the tribe of Simeon above the age of 20. Look at verse 23. Those that were numbered of them, even of the tribe of Simeon, were 50 and 9,300. So 59,300 men in one tribe. Of certain age. Okay, this is not including the women and children of this tribe. This is not including the young boys of this tribe. So, roughly, I'm going to round up here, 60,000. It says 59,300. I'm just rounding up. Roughly 60,000 men, okay? So, I mean, you can basically double that number, maybe triple that number to get the whole tribe of Simeon to get a good guess. Uh, uh, you know, maybe... You know, if each family's having an average of two kids, most of them were having more than that, uh, you're probably looking at a pretty large number here. That's why estimates are there were somewhere around 3 million plus Israelites that Moses is having to manage here. It's a lot of people. A lot of people, okay? So anyways, right around 60,000. And then skip down to verse number 26. I wanted to include this tribe because this is the largest tribe. And later on, this is the tribe that the Messiah comes out of. And David comes out of this tribe, the tribe of Judah. In verse number 26, it says, Of the children of Judah, by their generations, after their families, by the house of their fathers, according to the number of the names, from 20 years old and upward, all that were able to go forth to war, those that were numbered of them, even of the tribe of Judah, were threescore, that's 60, uh, 60, and 14, so 74,600. So that's the largest tribe, 74,600. It's quite a few, okay? Quite a few men there. Now, <clears throat> hold your place there. Well, I'll tell you what, look at uh, verse 46 real quick, and, and we'll get out of, of chapter 1. Look at verse 46. It's going to summarize all the tribes for you. It's going to summarize all 12 of them. Well, Technically, in this book, there's 13 tribes. 
okay, because this is not including the tribe of Levi. This number right here in verse 46 is not including the tribe of Levi. It's including the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, which were both sons of Joseph. Verse 46, even all they that were numbered, remember it's just those men, 20 years old and upward, were 600,000 and 3,550. So 600, 3,550 men. 603,000. Quite a few. Quite a few. That, that's quite a military. That's a large army. Those are, those are the warring men. Okay, that, that's a sizable army. Uh, pretty large. I think that's bigger than America's standing army now. Okay, that would have been a rather large army to field. Okay? Now it also goes on. It said, he tells him in verse 47, But the Levites, after the tribe of their fathers, were not numbered among them, but they did wind up numbering them uh, later on in chapter 3 and verse 39. All that were numbered of the Levites, which Moses and Aaron numbered at the commandment of the Lord throughout their families, all the males from a month old and upward. So this isn't 20 years old enough were 20 and 2,000. So 22,000 males in the tribe of Levi. They were the priesthood. And that's why they're not included with the other tribes here. They were a special tribe. And so 22,000. Those numbers are important. They're important because then if you skip to chapter 26, the book of Numbers is derived from two numberings of the people, or two censuses. The first one we just read, part of it, in chapter 1 and chapter 3. The second one takes place in chapter 26. Now in chapter 26 and verse number 12, notice here it says the sons of Simeon. Now didn't we read the first time? Roughly 60,000 men, correct? Remember, I rounded up, 60,000. It says the sons of Simeon, and skip down to verse 14. These are the families of the Simeonites, Twenty and two thousand and two hundred. That tribe went from sixty thousand people to twenty-two thousand people. Now that's a drop of thirty-eight thousand. That's quite a drop. What happened? Something has happened from chapter one to chapter twenty-six. Something drastic to the tribe of Simeon. Thirty-eight thousand people now missing. Did they go to war? Did they have battles? I mean. Wow, something crazy has happened here. Now, if you uh, look at verse number 19, you'll see Judah mentioned. It wasn't like this for every tribe. Not every tribe lost that many. It says, the sons of Judah, and then it says in verse 22, it tells you, look at verse 22. These are the families of Judah, according to those that were numbered of them, three score, that's 60, and 16,500. So they actually gained 2,000 people. They were 74,000, now they're 76. So something has changed. And then if you summarize it, I believe the summary is found in verse 51, it is. These were the number of the children of Israel, 600,000 and 1,730. So they've actually lost right around 1,700 people total. They went from 603,000 and something, I think it was 550 if I remember correctly, to 601,000. So they've gone from 603,000 to 601,000. So it's not a big change. It was a huge one in the tribe of Simeon, but other tribes got bigger. But what changed during these two censuses? Well, 40 years changed. This book covers 40 years. A pretty big expanse of time. And uh, these are not the key chapters. Even though the book gets its name from these two chapters, these are not the key chapters. The key chapter is found in chapter number 13. And we will look at it next after a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I just want to lift up our time together to you now. And Lord, I just ask you to take over. Lord, I appreciate your word. Lord, thank you for the book of Numbers. I know a lot of times we're not so... Uh, it's not maybe not our favorite book, but Lord, it's a good book. Uh, it, it teaches a very valuable lesson, and I thank you for it. Lord, I just ask you to help me to be clear tonight in the message. And Lord, I just ask you to, to give us uh, 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 just undivided attention. Lord, I, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just have, have its way, uh, have his way with us tonight, Lord. Lord, I just ask you to take over in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. Appreciate you standing. 
I just really wanted to give you the reason why this is called the Book of Numbers. I mean, you may wonder that from time to time. When you come to the Book of Numbers, you go, why? Why name a book Numbers? But And I didn't read the tribe of Levi. I'm pretty sure their tribe stayed around the same. They went from 22,000, I think, to 23,000 over that 40 years. That's not an increase, if you hadn't noticed. Did you notice how similar those numbers were? They went from 603,000... 40 years later, there's 601,000. They go from 22,000 in the tribe of Levi to 23,000. And these are the males, of course. But there's not a big increase. You would think these families are having five kids apiece, you know, ten kids apiece. I don't know how many they're having, but they're having, I mean, some families are having a lot. Some there was There's one guy in there, he doesn't have any sons. He has some daughters. Uh, his name is Zalofi Had. He has some daughters. But, I mean, they're having kids. And you would think that their population would have went up, right? You would think that. That's what populations do. Uh, has the population of the United States increased? Astronomically. <laughs> uh, take a look at New York City sometime. Uh, what is it? Population 8 million? I think there's 8 million in, in New York City alone. How many people live in Oklahoma total? I think there's 600,000 in Oklahoma City. 650,000. Uh, there was 600,000 men in their, in their army, to give you an idea. So that would be uh, the entire population of Oklahoma City coming at you. Uh, but, I mean, what, what is the population of Oklahoma, Daniel? You should have that odd number. What is it, like 7 million? 4 million. 4 million? Okay. I was way off. Uh, but, I mean, uh, New York City probably has, I, I guess, more people in it than all the state of Oklahoma. Uh, man, that's just astronomical numbers. That's what's natural for a nation. Nations tend to go up, uh, especially in, in times where people looked at children as a blessing. I was, uh, uh, families used to, to have eight, nine kids, ten kids. Risa, how many brothers and sisters you got? I'm not trying to pick on you, but how many you got? Mama had a dozen kids. Mm -hmm. Dozen, right there. Twelve tribes of Mama, right there. No. <laughs> Just to, but uh, no, I mean that was that that was pretty normal. You know that that used to be normal. Now the average, uh, I, I read somewhere, the average white American family averages two children. Uh, the average uh, African American family averages three children. The average Muslim family averages somewhere around eight. If that gives you pause at all. Gives me a little bit. Uh, there's an outnumbering that's happening in, in the world, and, and it, it's, it's going in favor of the Muslims. But anyway, I, I digress. In, in, in normal terms, especially back in the old days, we might say, people had children, and they had a lot of them. So for a nation's population over 40 years to stay the same and actually to drop a little bit is odd. It's very odd for that to happen unless something catastrophic happened to them, uh, unless a, a disease hit them, or unless warfare struck them. And, and, and really, neither one of those happen. What happens in the book of Numbers, in the key chapters, are chapters 13 and 14. In chapter 13, look at uh, verse number 1. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel, of every tribe of their fathers shall you send a man, every one a ruler among them. So the twelve spies are twelve rulers. And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. All those men were heads of the children of Israel. It goes on, it names them. It says in verse 17, And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, it says in verse 21, So they, the spies, went up and searched the land of the wilderness of Zin unto Rahab as men come to Hamath. In verse 25, you will find that it says, And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. The 12 spies searched the land of Canaan for 40 days. It says in verse 26, And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran, to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, 
We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Oh, they agree with the Lord. It is a blessed land. It's a wonderful looking land. Verse 28, Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in, that, in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. Now the children of Anak are giants, the Anakims. It says in verse 29, And the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb, one of the twelve spies, still the people before Moses. In other words, he's trying to calm them down. And said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Caleb has the confidence in the Lord to do this. The, uh, now, ten of the other spies don't. I say ten of the others because another guy, Joshua, he's with Caleb. He's like, yeah, we can get them. Let's do this. It says, verse 31, But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report. That's what the Bible says. It says this is an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of a great statue. They're so focused on their problems, they're not focused on the God that can take care of their problems. They've got the opposite uh, perspective. They, they've, they've really got the perspective of Israel in the future when they're sitting there scared to death and David comes up and says, well, I can slay the giant. David in, in the same cloth of Caleb and Joshua. It's interesting, later on in the book of Joshua, Caleb at the age of 85 is willing to fight giants and take a mountain. That's the kind of man Caleb is. In verse 33 it says, And there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. It says in chapter 14, verse number 1, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night, and all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, would God that we had died in the land of Egypt. What a request. After everything that God has brought them through, after the parting of the Red Sea, after the ten plagues on the house of Pharaoh, after defeating uh, the Amalekites that came out and they had to hold Moses' hands up during the battle and Joshua gave them victory, after all of this stuff, after... After the, the smiting of the rock and the water uh, giving them refreshment and after, after God feeding them with manna, this is how they respond. Ungrateful. Unthankful for everything God has done for them. Oh, that we had died in the land of Egypt. I'd rather die than go over there and fight in the land of Canaan. That's what they're saying. I would have rather died a slave than be free and come over here and fight for my land. I'd, I'd rather have died as a slave. That's what they're saying. He goes on and says, Or would God we had died in this wilderness? Oh, what a request there. Lord, could you let us die right here? Right here in this desert. And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. And in the next passage here, I'm going to skip ahead for, for the sake of time, but you know, it says in verse 6, And Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, uh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. In verse 5, it tells us Moses and Aaron fell on their faces. In verse 7, it says, And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, what faith these men have. If the Lord delight in us, then He will bring us into this land and give it us a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not. Joshua and Caleb have put their finger on exactly what's going on. You're rebelling against the Lord, Israel. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. 
their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. The congregation reacts in verse 10. It says, but all the congregation bade stone them with stones. Let's kill them. Let's kill Joshua and Caleb. How dare they say these things. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me? For all the signs which I have showed among them, I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them and will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. In other words, God tells Moses, I'm going to restart this whole thing with you. Moses intercedes for them. He's, Moses says in verse 19 to the Lord, Pardon, I beseech thee the iniquity of this people according unto the greatness of thy mercy and as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. In verse 20, we've got a little more reading to do. It says, And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. In other words, he's saying, I'm not going to utterly kill them right now. It says in verse 21, But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness have tempted me now these ten times. I find it interesting the Lord was keeping up with how many times the men of Israel had tempted him. Hey, Brennan, Brennan, come here. Now, son, come sit right here on the front. Right here. Thank you, sir. The Lord says, They've tempted me now these ten times and have not hearkened to my voice. Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoke me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whereinto uh, he went, and his seed shall possess it. Go, uh, scoot on down uh, to, verse, well, to verse 26. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Now listen to this very carefully, the Lord's judgment on these people. How long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me. Say unto them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears. In other words, just like you said, people, so will I do to you. He said, you wanted to die in the wilderness? Here you go. Wasn't that what they said? You remember their request? They said, would that we have died in the wilderness? He said, do you remember saying that? Well, here you go. He says in verse 29, Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me. That number. Verse 30, Doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. Only two men from this generation get to enter into the promised land. Canaan. He says, But your little ones, which ye said should be a prey, them, you know, you remember saying that? He, he's saying, you remember saying your little ones are going to be a prey? Them will I bring in. And they shall know the land which ye have despised. But as for you, your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years, and bear your whoredom, whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of the days in which... Listen to this. He said, I'm giving you a year for each day you spied out the land. After the number of the days in which you search the land, even 40 days each day for a year, shall ye bear your iniquities even 40 years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. I, the Lord, have said, I will surely do it unto all this evil congregation that are gathered together against me in this wilderness, they shall be consumed, and there uh, they shall die. The reaction of the people, says in verse 36, And the men which Moses sent to search the land, look at this, the other ten spies who returned and made all the congregation a murmur against him by bringing up a slander upon the land, even those men that did bring up the evil report upon the land, died by the plague before the Lord 
those guys went ahead and died. Right there, those ten. Well, that had to be something. That had to shock the people a little bit. Oh, the Lord is sealing this. He means business. The number ten popping up so much right here. Very interesting. I don't want to get off into numbers too much. But the, the Ten Commandments are the representation of the law. And the law here, it, it's the representation of what we are judged by. And here these guys of judgment has fallen on them and ten men died because he said these ten times uh, you, you've murmured against me. It says in verse 38, But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of the men that went to search the land, lived still. And Moses told these sayings unto all the children of Israel. What you just heard me say. Hey, Brennan, sit down. What you just heard me read. The Bible says Moses told the whole congregation of Israel. What you just had to listen to, these people had to listen to. And this actually pertained to them. Like, literally. Can you imagine being one of those people? As uncomfortable as that passage is to read, and it's uncomfortable, isn't it? Doesn't make me feel real good. This is probably this. This is one of my least favorite books in the Bible, just because it's a sad story. It is a very sad. It's a very sobering story. It's a very serious story. God means business, and it says, "And the people mourned greatly." Now they got their wish. They said, "If we just die in the wilderness." Oh, but they mourned with their wish. It wasn't exactly what they thought it was going to be, is it? It wasn't what they wanted. This is the key book of the, of the book of Numbers. This is why at the beginning of Numbers there's 603,000, and at the end of Numbers in chapter 26, it's not the very end, but after that he starts giving them some more laws and regulations and things like that. But this is why in number, Numbers 26, the number of the people has stayed the same. These two chapters right here are the whole key to this book. If this had gone differently, if this had gone differently, if the people had just trusted the Lord, if, if God's people had just trusted the Lord, quit murmuring, quit running their mouth, quit complaining, and, and just done what He said, and obeyed Him and trusted Him with their lives, I mean, how different could this have been? Brendan, come here. Come here, now. Bring me the ink pen. Sit on the floor, bud. On the floor. You're distracting too much. Thank you. He was drawing pictures on his pants. Sorry. Uh, I mean, how different could this have been? I, this, this book and like the story of King Saul, two of the saddest stories in the whole Bible. I, every time I read about King Saul, I'm like, please choose differently. Please do something different. It's like it's like watching a movie and you know how it, you, you've seen it before. You know how it's going to go. Old Yeller, please don't get rabies. Please don't get you know. And you're just oh come on, and your heart's just wrenched over it every time I read about the Israelites here. Oh please choose differently, but they always choose the same. It's a very sobering book. There's a couple of theories. I mentioned this uh, last Sunday. There's a couple of theories on what Canaan land pictures. And I want to mention both of them. I have one that I, I believe more fits the Bible. But the other one does have an application. And it's an interesting application. The Canaan land, in fact, most people believe this. They believe Canaan land or the promised land pictures heaven. Heaven is a promised land. So that does make some sense. Okay, I can see where they get that. I don't necessarily agree with that being the main interpretation. I can see an application. Here's the application. The first five books of the Bible are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They're called the Law. They're called the Pentateuch. They're written by Moses. Moses is, is the representative of the Law Giver. The Law will not save you. The keeping of the Law will not save your soul. You cannot earn your way to heaven. And that's an interesting application, isn't it? Yet Joshua gets to take the people into the promised land. That's heaven. Joshua, the name Joshua, is the same name Jesus. And it means Savior. Very interesting application there. That the law will not save your soul, but Jesus will. So I do love that application. I absolutely love that. 
it's not the, the direct interpretation of Canaan land, but it's a wonderful application, okay? I, I have to admit, that's an absolutely wonderful application. Uh, Joshua, if you're wondering why that is, Jesus is the Greek rendering of the same name. Uh, the Hebrews don't call Jesus, Jesus. They call him Yeshua. And they call him that because they, the J's are silent. Like, Joseph is actually Yosef. Uh, so uh, it, it's kind of a silent ya. Yeah. So anyone, anytime they say Jesus, they actually refer to him as, as Yeshua. So Joshua. It's another reason that Joshua is spelled Jeshua in the book of Ezra. There's a high priest named Jeshua. It's the same name. It means literally Savior. When you say Jesus Christ, you're saying Savior, the anointed one. Or Savior, Messiah. That's what they mean. And so it's, it's, it, it is an interesting application. Here's the main interpretation, though, that I want to give you tonight. Cain and land really best pictures the blessed Christian life. Amen. The blessed Christian life. And here's why. Here's the main reason it, it, it doesn't necessarily uh, line up uh, with, with, uh, with it being heaven. There's, there's no battles in heaven. There's no enemies in heaven. And that, that's the biggest thing that stands out to you. Uh, when they go into Canaan land, they still have to fight. Now, there are battles to be fought in the Christian life. And there are giants to be taken on in the Christian life. And there, there are, there are uh, enemies, and they're scary sometimes, in the Christian life. The book of Genesis, we talked about it Sunday morning, is the book of beginnings. And a person, when they begin a walk with the Lord, when they begin, that's called the new birth. That's a new beginning. Okay, that's a, a person being born again. And so they've begun a walk with the Lord. Exodus is where they're exiting the world. And Egypt is a picture of the world. And so it's, the, it's a picture of the Christian coming out of the world. You know, he's been born again and he needs to come out of the world. Make sense? Leviticus is that, that Christian needs to enter into personal holiness. The book of Leviticus is all about holiness. In fact, Peter quotes Leviticus in the New Testament when he says, Be ye holy as I am holy. And he's quoting God there. God tells him three times in the book of Levit Leviticus, Be ye holy for I am holy. Or as I am holy. Now, what that's picturing, I talked about it Sunday, you're born again, you're to exit out of the world, you're to enter into personal holiness. Now that's going to... That's going to bring some combat. That's going to bring some spiritual battles. That's going to bring some conflict. Your flesh doesn't like that. Your flesh doesn't want to live a holy life under the Lord. You've been saved by grace. You've been born again. You've been forgiven of your sins. You've been given the free gift of salvation. But then God says, you're still breathing on that earth. And I want you to live a holy life before me. I want you to exit out of the world. I want you to get out of ungodly music. And I want you to get out of ungodly habits. And I want, to get, I want you to get out of watching ungodly filth on the TV and running around with ungodly people. Amen. He's not saying don't witness to ungodly people. Obviously, he says it over and over emphatically. He wants to win them. He wants people to come to Christ. He wants them to receive the free gift of forgiveness. And then he wants to actually give them a blessed Christian life. But we've got to exit the world. Right. We've got to enter into personal holiness. We've got to start allowing Jesus Christ to clean us up Amen. as Christians. It's very important. Very important. You're not going to win anybody if you don't. You're not going to have any impact on other people if you don't. If they don't see a change in your life, what impact are you going to have? If you're just the same as they are, there's no difference. In fact, your life should be somewhat convicting. You say, well, that makes people not like me. Good! I hope they like you, but... At least you're having an impact. You know, that you can't help if they're under conviction just because of how you're living your life for the Lord. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Uh, Peter said, happy are ye if you suffer for the name of Christ. Yeah. That's just a minor suffering. There have been people who have been killed over their beliefs. Oh, oh, oh. Numbers is the Christian who says, thanks but no thanks. Not interested. You know that promised land? You know that blessed Christian life you're talking about, Jesus? Thanks for saving me. I appreciate that. But no thanks. 
That's hard. Giants, really? Battles? Have you seen Jericho? Uh, Lord, uh, thanks for saving my soul, but I don't think you can handle that. It's a lack of faith in a Christian. And it brings them to this point where they're so overwhelmed by their enemies, they say, oh, would that you have not even saved my soul. I, I hate to admit this, I've had moments where that has crossed my mind. I've had moments where, oh, I just wish I wasn't a Christian right now. Oh, the Holy Spirit doesn't let me get away with anything. Yeah. Convicts me of everything. I was having a conversation with Johnny that, uh, today, I, I wish she were in here. I'm not trying to tell her stuff, but uh, she was she was aggravated about something, and and uh, she was asked, "Well, why don't you do something about it?" She said, "Because I'm a Christian." And the, Lord, and the Lord won't let me. He won't let me get away with it. The Book of Numbers pictures the Christian that is not interested in serving the Lord. It looks too hard. It looks too boring. Remember what they said over in chapter 13? Let me, let me refresh your memory. How, what was their report? It says in verse 26, And the spies went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us and surely... It floweth with milk and honey. And this is the fruit of it. I was reading that and I was thinking, you know how many people have complimented uh, Johnny and I and our family on how wonderful our family is? It don't, I'm not bragging. I'm really not. We have issues. We are not perfect. We have things that we struggle with all the time. But people will look at us and, and they'll say, wow, I, I want a family just like you guys have. You don't know the half of it. <laughs> if you knew the struggles, you're just seeing some fruit on the outside. It looks really good. It's beautiful. You're absolutely right. I love my children. They're absolutely wonderful. Brennan, on the other hand, not hid. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm just teasing. I'm teasing, Brennan. I love you, bunch. But I'm simply saying, you know, people will look at our life and they'll, I mean, we've had family members. Tell us, well, we'd sure like to have a marriage like you guys have, but man, that's a lot of work. I think I'd just rather quit. I'm not kidding. They've said this stuff. Well, we want kids like you have, but man, that's a lot of work. What's the point? I'm telling you, it's the exact same thing Israel was doing right here in Numbers. It's crazy how much this repeats itself in the life of Christians and in the life of Israel. It's really scary. It's really sad to me. Uh, I hate watching. I hate watching family members or church members or, or just people that I know that I went to school with. I'll run into. I mean, I, I ran into a, a girl one day at at a, at a little grocery at a little gas station. I, I re, last time I saw her, I think it was the eighth grade. But I, when I when I look at her, I still think third, fourth grade. I, I see a third or fourth grader. She smiled at me. All of her teeth are gone. Her gums are black. She's been using crack. No. No. Why'd you go that way? I hate seeing that. It tears me up. I mean, I was reading the front page of the newspaper the other day. My best friend in kindergarten involved in a car wreck midday, and he's been in prison. He has some issues. I'm pretty sure they led to his car wreck. I know another guy. I mean, he's been in and out of prison two or three times. I, I mean, every time I think of him, I think eighth grader. And it just aches me. I've got family members doing this. I've got old friends doing this. They're going, well, you know, I can tell the Christian life's a good one. I can tell the Christian life's a blessing. I can, tell it's I can tell that you're a blessing to other people. This is awesome. I can tell that it is the land flowing with milk and honey. I can tell that the grapes are great. I can tell all the blessings of that life. Thanks, but no thanks. See why it's one of the saddest books in the Bible? 
That's their mindset. I hope that's not our mindset. I hope when we face life's trials and life's battles, we have the spirit of Caleb. We have the spirit of Joshua. Hey, look, I don't know how I'm going to do it. There have been some things in my life I'm going, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but the Lord's just going to have to do it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I'm just going to go. I tell you, when He was first calling me to preach, I'm going, do you know? I've told you this. Do you know who you're calling to preach? Uh, I'm scared to death to be up in front of people. Are you, are, are you aware? You know, and then I read about Moses. He struggled with the same thing. And, 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 and I'm going, Lord, you got the wrong guy. In fact, I, I just remember, Lord, all right, you're going to have to do it. Here I go. I'm glad I did that. Really glad I did that. Marriage, Lord, you're going to have to do this. I'm glad I did that. Children, Lord, you, you know how many guys are running away from their responsibility to their children today? How many parents? It's scaring them. You know, many, you know how many people are having abortions because it's scaring them? I'm not making fun. I'm not making light. It is scary. Take it on with the Lord's help. Yeah, it is too much for you on your own, but it's not too much for the Lord. It is a giant. It is a battle, but you can take it on. That's the point of numbers. It's warning you, don't be like these guys. Don't be like these guys. Too many Christians of our day are like these guys. It's interesting. It, it's uh, it's mind-boggling to me the fact that the Book of Numbers has so much application to us today. <laughs> Leviticus represents entering into a life of personal holiness, uh, spiritual battles. Numbers represents the Christians who aren't real interested. Numbers is the wasted or the waste of numbers because the Christian said, no thanks, not interested. The numbers can re represent a lot of things. Here it represented 40 years and, and it represented uh, uh, two, two numberings of the people. It, it represented a whole generation of people is what it represented. The numbers in our life can represent years that we waste not serving the Lord. I'm fully convinced I was, I was saved when I was 13. I'm fully convinced I wasted the next 10 years of my life. And I will not get those back. Thankful the Lord woke me up. I'm thankful I'm serving Him now. Amen. And I do not intend to waste any more years or any more time. But I'm simply saying, it can, it can represent time that you're wasting. It can represent opportunities. The numbers of opportunities that a Christian misses. I wonder, it can represent blessings. How many opportunities have we missed to witness and share the gospel? Because we're so stuck on ourselves. I wonder... This generation of Christians, I wonder, when we give an account to the Lord, the opportunities that we had to get in our Bible and study it and meditate on it and memorize it. You realize the Jews used to memorize the whole first five books of the Bible? Like young Jewish men. Can you imagine memorizing the whole book of Leviticus? How about the book of Numbers? How about Deuteronomy? Not exactly the most... Jesus quoted Deuteronomy more than any book of the Old Testament. Young Jewish men would, re would, would uh, memorize all five books when we stand before, before the Lord. Think about the, the opportunities that we've wasted. Think about the blessings. I think about this all the time. America is wasting blessings. American Christians are wasting blessings. They're wasting blessings because they don't realize how blessed they are. We're so spoiled rotten, we don't realize how good we've got it. I, I, I remember growing up as a kid, and, and my mom would, would do my laundry. She would, she would cook us meals. I've mentioned this before. I got so burnt out on salmon patties. I got so burnt out on those things, I didn't realize how good I had it. Man, them things are good. Get out on your own, start living on your own, eating your own cooking. 
Salmon patties are a feast. Yep. Amen. Wasting of blessings, I'm telling you. America is wasting their blessings. The book of Numbers. It's, like, it's the Christian who says, I'm almost persuaded. You almost persuaded me, Lord, to serve you. Numbers is about the high cost of the disobedient, rebellious Christian. Remember when they said you're rebelling against the Lord? It's the high cost of the disobedient, rebellious Christian. Deuteronomy is when the Lord finally has that rebellious Christian's attention and He reminds them what they're supposed to be doing. It's the second giving of the law. You're supposed to be serving the Lord. You're saved. You're born again. You're a Christian. You're supposed to be serving the Lord. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. You're supposed to be doing what I say. It's the second giving of the law. Why do you need to give it a second time? Because now He has the Christian's attention. Then in Joshua, they get to live the victorious Christian life. Do you see it? Do you see how the books are pictured? Oh, it's absolutely wonderful. It's amazing. This is a sad portion of it. I, I hate that, that so many Christians have to go through a sad prodigal time like this. And this was a prodigal time for Israel. But boy, did God get the next generation's attention. They went in. Can you imagine? Think about just the city of Jericho. And God told them all to be quiet, march around the city seven times, don't say a word. Can you imagine for seven days not saying a word? And then the seventh day, seven times? I mean, no jokes. Brother Richard, you can't say anything to Miss Louise while you're marching around the city. Brother Benny, don't talk to Miss Reese. Brother Jason, don't talk to Miss Rachel. Pallone, you and Sophie, cut it out. Blake, you too. Miss Nanette, no talking to Ethan. I can't talk to any of my kids. You know, Dad and Mom, quit it. You know? And they're marching around Jericho. Can you imagine the amount of self-control? How much, how sold out they must have been. Wow, we don't understand what we're doing. This is crazy. But he told us to do it. So we're going to do it. So much different than this generation. You see the change? Yeah. It's like Mary told, told the servants, Whatever, whatsoever he saith unto you to do, do it. The next generation got it. They learned from this generation's example. I hate that the Lord had to make an example of this generation, but He did. And He got the next generation, and they got to go into the Canaan land, they got to conquer, and they got to have the victorious Christian life, is what it pictures for us. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that a hallelujah? I'm glad the Lord didn't give up on Israel, aren't you? I'm glad He didn't give up on me. I'm glad He hadn't given up on you. I'm glad that you can learn from your past decisions. And you can decide to live the victorious Christian life. This is why people trying to live a, a godly life without Jesus is impossible. You can't do it without Joshua. That's what it's picturing. You Listen, tons of religions out there teach you can keep the commandments and get to heaven. No, no, no. You can't. You can't do it. You can't, you can't even serve the Lord without the Holy Spirit of God within you. It's impossible for your flesh to please God. You need Jesus. And then He'll give you that victorious Christian life. Tonight I want to ask you to say yes. I don't know what giants you're going to be facing and I don't know what battles you're going to be facing, but I want to ask you tonight to just say yes to the Savior. Maybe tonight you're not saved. You're not sure of your salvation. Just say yes to the Savior. Uh, tonight if you, if you are saved, I just want to ask you to, again, just say yes, whatever He's telling you to do. Think about